Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com. Bernstein Show. Here's Ed. Well, if you haven't gotten the words yet, there is an election this November, and um, one category, judges, probably the most important category that will affect your life, oftentimes gets the least amount of attention. And with me now, today, well, I was going to say two candidates, but I have one candidate and one former candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah Westbrook and uh, Nadia Wood, and let me let me discern what I'm talking about uh, to, to our audience. Um, you were a, a candidate um, for Justice Court, Nadia, and you ran against several people. And the law in uh, these primary elections is that if you get 50 percent or more of the vote, that's it. You don't have to run in the general seat. You get elected which happened to you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. And, and Deborah, um, you are running for a different court, a Court of Appeals, That's right. which is relatively a new court in, in Nevada. And, um, and you do have an opponent, and you do have an election in, no, in November. That's correct. Right. We did not have a primary. Did not have a primary, because, because there's only there's two candidates. Two. Right. So if there's more than two candidates running for judge, they kind of fend, fend off in the primary. And if one gets over 50 percent, then they end up in Nadia's <laughs> position, and uh, or else they, um, they you know, top two go on to the general, which is where you are. That's right. So let's talk about the difference of these two courts, uh, Nevada Court of Appeals and Justice Court. Who wants to go first? So I think um, starting with the Justice Court, since it's the first court that people will most likely see. Yeah. That's true. Yes. So. And, and I should say the two you currently work together. We do, yes. Right, in the Clark County Public Defender's Office. So you yes. both have that kind of background and familiarity with, with the courts and the systems. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's right. Um, so the Las Vegas Justice Court, I always say it's the People's Court. Um, it is the court statistically that most people, normal people, is their elected official that they are most likely in to encounter in their everyday lives because it handles everything that you know you think of when you think of court for just ordinary people. It handles traffic tickets. It handles all criminal matters when they start out. It handles civil cases that are less than 15,000. So we're talking about things that aren't big business, aren't big corporations, just everyday issues between neighbors and things like that, those, those disputes that are less than $15,000. And it handles evictions. Um, and so it's, it's the very last race on the ballot. It's all the way at the end. But I argue that you know, it's, it's the race that you really should pay attention to because it's most likely to personally impact you. You are most likely to appear in front of me out of any elected official in all of the state of Nevada. And, and I should say, although you have been elected, there are some other um, justice court races that are going forward in November, right, that people should pay attention to. That's correct, yes. Uh, yeah. Las Vegas Justice Court has 16 justice courts, and I can't remember exactly how many are on the ballot in the general. But there's a couple. But there are yeah. several, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the Court of Appeals, uh, th th I mean, that's um, something I, I think that, that fits you very well since you're such, you love to write. and. And writing opinions is, uh, is an important job in the Court of Appeals. Exactly. Yeah. And so the Court of Appeals, we've only had a Court of Appeals since uh, the end of 2014 when the voters approved it. Um, and it was very necessary at that point before the Court of Appeals was created. We had one Supreme Court that would handle appeals from everything from um, driver's license revocations to death penalty matters. And that court uh, was inundated with cases at the time. Um, typically about 3,000 or so appeals are filed every single year. And so back in 2014 when that was happening, all of those cases were going up to the Supreme Court. And the justices on average had over 350 cases a person or per judge, which effectively meant that each judge is deciding almost one case per day in order to stay, um, you know, stay on top of their caseload, which was a very, very, um, you know, it's not, it's not a situation that you want to have. Our, our state was, um, had one of the highest caseloads in the country per judge. The ABA recommends only 100 cases per judge. So it was very, very apparent that we needed a court of appeals. And the court of appeals, when it was created, the purpose of it is, is to take um, 
approximately a third of the, the cases from the Supreme Court in a pushdown model. So every case is filed with the Supreme Court, and then about a third are sent down to the Court of Appeals, and, and they're resolved under um, typically under existing law. They're cases that can be quickly decided, cases that can be, um, you know, give the parties finality, and you, you typically will get a decision from the Court of Appeals within six months of the case getting assigned. So it's, it's a mechanism to have a quicker decision and that oftentimes was taking years for something to get up to the Supreme Court. But how does, how does the Supreme Court make a decision on whether or not they're going to hear that case or send it over to the Court of Appeals? Because it could also go from the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court Right, it can be sure, appealed again, right? Um, it's a slightly different mechanism, but mm -hmm. what, what happens is there's, a, there's an appellate court rule, Rule 17, that kind of guides where cases are, um, where cases are routed. And so um, if you have a case that has an issue of first impression, an issue of statewide public importance or constitutional significance, those are, uh, you know, going to be retained by the Supreme Court because those are, those are very, very important cases. Mm -hmm. Death penalty cases stay at the Supreme Court. Um, termination of parental rights cases stay at the Supreme Court. And, and the rule actually spells out a, a you know, number of categories of cases that must stay at the Supreme Court. So that's how the Supreme Court generally knows what cases will stay. There is a category of cases that are presumptively assigned to the Court of Appeals. They don't have to go to the Court of Appeals, but they, but they typically will. So if somebody pleads guilty to, um, you know, to a crime and they want to appeal from their sentence, if you've, if you've pled guilty, you typically um, are, are giving up a number of your appellate rights. And so you have a, you know, a few that are left, and those are easier to resolve. Those will go to the the Court of Appeals. Um, cases, sort of cases of that nature are in the rule will, um, you know, there, there are categories that, that say which ones go to the Court of Appeals. You know, you correct me if I'm wrong, it's just my observation, but when I look at um, our Court of Appeals, and there's three, there's three members of, of the Court of Appeals. That's correct. But you currently um, work in the Public Defender's Office doing strictly appellate work. I mean, you're the exactly. one who's arguing in front of the Court of Appeals all the time. I don't know of anybody who has the background that you have litigating the number of appeals and in front of the Court of Appeals in the Supreme Court. Um, I mean, your job ready. Yeah, no, I mean that's and that's and that's one of the reasons, if, if not the, the biggest reason, why I would love to, you know, and, and I, you know, I hope to be on the court next year so that I can take what I have learned, um, litigating in front of the Court of Appeals mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court, reading the decisions that come out, and kind of understanding the philosophy of the, of the various justices and the judges, you know, being able to craft the the arguments that are going to be the most persuasive, and to be able to take sort of that experience and apply it as a judge and, and you know, be able to weed through arguments that are not the best and, and figure out what the right answer is. It's, that's, I think, the thing that I love the most about appellate practice is really, you know, going through that record and figuring out, is there an error and was it harmful? Yeah, but you also have a background as a writer and yes. that's, look, it's very helpful because that's an important uh, con, you know, uh, uh, characteristic of somebody who wants to be a, an appellate or a Supreme Court or any kind of judge, Absolutely. really, and judges write opinions all day long. Right, um, so you have a love of writing. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, and I mean, in yeah. my in my background, I wrote. You know, I wrote for my high school paper. I wrote for my college paper. I worked at a you know right. TV news station out of out of college, and, and was writing on law review. I love writing. Is really kind of throughout my life has been the one thing that um, I, I would say. I've, I've always done. Paid attention in English class, huh? <laughs> yeah. and, and Nadia, you always loved litigating things, right? I mean, <laughs> yes. kind of. I mean, look, I, I didn't. As a, when I was younger, I didn't like to write particularly, um, you know. But, <laughs> but um, you know, av you know, you're, it, it, the, those two components are really what a judge needs. You know, the ability to understand litigation and the ability to take um, a concept and reduce it to writing that is clear, concise, that. 100 years from now, uh, another judge is going to follow. Right. Right. So what is it in, um, in your background that, that encouraged you to be an attorney? To be an attorney. An attorney. You start with an attorney because, you know, <laughs> I mean, let, 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 yeah. let's talk about where you are right now because sure. I, I really yeah. didn't finish the comment. I mean, sure. you, you got elected yes. in the primary. Yes. In, uh, when was that, in uh, June? Yes. Yep. And, um, and you don't take office until January. That's correct, yeah. Right, so you're still employed at the Clark County Public Defender's Office, still representing um, um, clients there. Yes. Right, and still working. Yes, yeah, okay. so because, I mean, it doesn't happen too often. It happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen too often that individuals win outright in the primary. Generally, you win in November, and so you take office in January, and you've got about that month, month and a half to make that transition. Right. Um, I was very, very fortunate that I won in June, but so 
my office doesn't, you know, I don't take office till January, so I'm going to continue working at the public defender's office where I am at uh, um, and representing individuals who are indigent who don't have the money or ability to hire an attorney for themselves. Right, and, and is that what you wanted to do as I mean, you were younger? I mean, you, you, have you, did you have this drive to be a lawyer or, or I mean, what, was, what is your, you know, when you were going to school, what were you, when did you feel like you really wanted to be an attorney? Um, I've known, like, I, I kind of decided pretty early on. It's kind of, it, so I was like a little bit of a dorky kid. <laughs> and probably by the time I was about 13, 14, I was like, you know what? I, I, I used to watch those law shows and I just loved the idea of fighting for the little guy and fighting for the underdog. Um, and I, really the idea of that, like, David and Goliath type of um, dynamic really mm -hmm. appealed to me. I wanted to be a voice for people who oftentimes don't have a voice. Um, and so I, I figured out pretty early that I wanted to be an attorney and actually figured out pretty early that I wanted to be a public defender um, because for me, the idea of being able to help people who often have never had anybody advocating for them and have never had anybody in their corner really appealed to me. Um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do good in our criminal justice system and a lot of opportunity to help people. And so I decided I was gonna go to law school and I was gonna be a public defender. And, that's how I ended up here. And good for you. And I assume you agree with everything she just said. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I was in the public defender's office, too. A long time ago, nice. but that's where I got started. Um, I wanted to ask about the process. You know, there's, there's been some stuff in the newspapers lately about judges. There's every election cycle we go through. Is it better to appoint judges? Is it better to elect judges? Uh, Nadia, you have kind of experience in both. Um, you had applied for an appointment and you ran for election. Um, you're going through your first um, political election, so it's all new to you. I'm just wondering what your, what your thoughts were on you know, contrasting elections from appointments. So I guess from, from my perspective, I think before I became a candidate and before I started going through the process, I think I probably initially thought, you know, appointments make sense. You, you, get, you get somebody appointed who's been vetted that, um, you know, has gone through, you know, a rigorous kind of testing process with, with, with a, you know, a, a panel, um, and, and then you'll get the most qualified candidate. Having now been a candidate and sort of seeing what you need to do, um, you know, in order to, to win an election, you need to reach out and, and get to know all the potential stakeholders in the community, get to know all the different types of attorneys that could be appearing in front of you, representing all different types of clients. And I have learned so much during this process. You know, previously, uh, you know, I, I practiced as, um, you know, a, a litigator uh, in the area of labor and employment law. So I was experienced in that area. I've been working at the public defender's office now for for nine years, and so I'm, you know, I, I know kind of the issues that face criminal defendants and and the defense community. But I had not been exposed to, you know, a lot of personal injury issues, um, the issues, you know, that relate to, you know, some of the constitutional law um, litigation that's mm -hmm. out there, and and the, you know, like the, the various groups that we have met with, and that I've had the opportunity to kind of hear what their concerns are about the law. It, it has really opened my eyes, and and I think I, it will make me a better judge having been exposed to all of those things through the process of running um, a campaign. So I, I, I'm actually, I've kind of flipped sides. I think I, I, think I like the, uh, the process. Having been through the having, experience. Having been through it, it. Yeah. Whether, win or lose, you yeah. know, it's, I, I will have learned so much and, and I'm, I'm, I think a much, um, I've got a much broader frame of mind at this point. And Nadia, what are your thoughts? You've been through both systems. Yeah, I've been through both. So I actually, before I ran for my current seat, um, there was an opening and I applied. And like Deborah talked about, there was this vetting process. There were 14 people who applied for the judicial seat. And I made it to the final three. So I made it through multiple rounds of interviews and applications and people reviewing the work that I'd done. And I was really honored to make it to the final three. It was such an incredible experience. And ultimately, the county commissioners decided to appoint one of the other candidates who was highly qualified. I have a lot of respect for her. She's a fantastic judge. I've appeared in front of her. Um, and really what I saw I think that I would contrast between the appointment process and the election process, because I've done both now, is with the appointment process, there was a greater focus on what you've done and your background and the work that you've done and all of those things, which is how I made it to the final three. And then once it was in the final three, it was kind of, I actually had one of the county commissioners say, well, you've got all of this great stuff on paper that you've done in terms of your litigation, but 
nobody knows who you are. You've never really been out there in the community, um, which was true. I, I was kind of always this legal nerd again that was just kind of filing my motions and doing my work in court, but not necessarily super politically active. Mm -hmm. And so county commissioners didn't know who I was. Um, but when I ran, that, that and I, I took that experience and I said, okay, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna get out there, I'm gonna introduce myself to people and talk about the work that I've done rather than just sitting in my office doing it. And I got to meet the community just like Deb talked about and I got to meet people and introduce myself and talk about why justice court's important and talk about why knowing who your judges is important and meeting so many different stakeholders and it was a great experience. And, and so I think it, I really learned a lot and I really met a lot of people. Um, and so I'm kind of fortunate that I've gotten to do both and it's, hard for me to say. I think that at the end of the day, the elections puts the power in the people's hands. And I think that that's important. I think that judges should be accountable to the people um, in terms of not necessarily, you know, judges sometimes have to make decisions people are going to disagree with. That's, that's the reality of being a judge. But I think that they should also be accountable because there is that check, there is that oversight when you are up for re-election when you are elected, and I think that's important. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I just want to, want to turn it around. I think people will need to be more accountable because what happens in an election, um, and we all know this, is um, very few voters actually know the judges or the candidates that are running. You know, they watch on TV, they'll see what's going on in a governor's race or a Senate, a Senate race or a presidential race. Uh, you don't really get to see that in judicial races because they don't have the kind of money and media attention that these other races have. And it oftentimes comes down to people picking names uh, or choosing, can, uh, voting for somebody they have no idea who it is and the qualifications. How do we get around that? I mean, I, I think part of, part of what you need is, is unfortunately money. I mean, candidates need to fundraise so that they can get their message out. And, you know, ideally the candidate that has the backing of, of the attorney community, um, you know, in a, in a judicial context would be able to get their message out to more people. I mean, and, and I think, you know, being able to tell the public, you know, who you are, what you stand for, that, that will in, in effect educate the voters. Uh, but in addition to that, getting out there um, and just going to the community events, having the judges, you know, the judicial candidates, that's part of, part of why, you know, um, the election process is important, you know, and the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the campaign process is important. Go to the events, meet, meet the regular people that are going to be voting and, and explain, you know, at a level that is, you know, not up in the, you know, the ivory tower, what it is that we do. And I think, you know, like Nadia has done a great job kind of bringing that home and explaining you know, why justice court is important. Yeah, you know, it seems to me that, you know, look, I, I get asked, like every attorney in this state gets asked, you know, who should I vote for for judge? You know, so, so I guess what you're saying is, you know, for sure get out there in the attorney world because, yep. because they're the messengers out there to the general public. But, uh, but it'd be nice if we had some sort of mechanism where the general public would just be better informed on who the candidates are. You know, it's, it's, it's just hard. TV programs like this are, uh, are helpful. Well, that's, we try. We, we, <laughs> we, do our, we do our bit here. Um, you're married I to am. an attorney also. Yes. And what's that like? Um, we got married in, in 2002, but you know, the, actually the first, the first year, um, first couple of years that I knew him, we were in law school together. Couldn't stand him. <laughs> he was, uh, you know, I'm the study nerd and he's kind of the class clown joker. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, I, I, I didn't even think about uh, going out with him until, you know, the third year there was a bunch of us we were all supposed to get together and, and uh, you know, we were, we were going to go as a group, everybody bailed, um, and then it was just the two of us. So two weeks later we got engaged, three weeks, three weeks after that we were married. Uh, Deborah, <laughs> I thought, no, if you're going to be a judge, you have to wait for all the evidence to be in before oh, you make a decision. Sometimes you just know, and and that was one that was one where I where I just knew, and yeah. you know it's been 20 years actually. We uh, uh, we got married in Las Vegas over spring break during our third year of law school, and uh, that was that was 20 years ago in in March. So uh, clearly the gamble that we made in Vegas years ago paid off. But I have I have had the um, pleasure of 
kind of working with Dave, you know, my whole um, my whole life, you know, or my whole, I guess, legal career. Right. Um, you know, we both went to D.C. together, had clerkships, and so kind of, you know, kind of did, did a little bit of collaboration there. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to Las Vegas, you know, he worked at the public defender's office, started there, and I was actually, um, you know, I was at Littler for eight years, and then I came over, and the two of us got to work together and collaborate on a number of cases. And he, he does the, uh, the litigating part, and, and you do the, the appellate yes. part. So, yes, so, so it's, it's a good team. It is a great team. I love, team. I love working with him. So, so what happens now? What is the, the rule now? I mean, obviously, he cannot appear in front of you. Exactly. Right? So... Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think the one thing that I'm probably going to miss the most, um, you know, going, going to the bench is, is no longer being able to, to, to collaborate in that way. Um, well, I how about making, how about taking your husband and being able to make a decision? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he can't talk back to yeah, you. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You miss no, that opportunity. No, there's the yeah. judicial canons say specifically, yeah. I cannot, <laughs> would not be able to over, oversee any of his cases. So. <laughs> Um, so it was an int intuitive thing with your husband, yes. which kind of segues into my next question. It seems to me that the last couple of elections um, for judges that women have dominated. You know, I, I, look, when I first started practicing law here, I, I, mean, we had, I can remember the first woman judge that we had, um, and, uh, and then Miriam Shearing, yep. um, and that was a big, we always had at least one female judge. Now, is the majority of our judges women or close to it? In, in the Eighth Judicial, certainly. Uh, yeah, for sure, right? In our Supreme, Supreme Court, Court is yep. majority women, right? And the appellate court will be yeah, you, women. Yeah, no matter, who, no matter who wins in November, it will be majority women. It'll be three, two, two women, um, one man. Why, why do you think that, that occurs? Nadia? <laughs> <laughs> um, well... I think it goes back to what you were talking about a little bit, that justice court, um, or not justice court, courts in general, um, are races that individuals just have less information, right? When they're, when they're trying to decide who to vote for, and because it's a nonpartisan race, it's particularly difficult, right? A lot of partisan races, people say, okay, I know this is how I lean, or these are the feelings that I have, and so right. seeing these letters next to the name helps me decide what I wanna vote for, but judicial races are nonpartisan because judges are supposed to not be making decisions based on politics. They're supposed to be making decisions based on what the law says. And so people are staring a lot of times at their ballots going, okay, I'm reading about this person and they're telling me all the great things they've done and I'm learning to read about this person and they're telling me all the great things they've done, but I don't know. Exactly. You know what I mean? Everybody is going to post the best thing about mm -hmm. themselves in every sphere. Um, and so I think for a lot of people, what it comes down to is they are looking at, okay, well, what I've been told personally is, you know, I want judges who I think are going to be compassionate. I want judges who I think, I've heard that so many times from so many people. I want judges who I think are going to try their hardest and work really hard and understand that human beings go through things and understand that, you know, just because the situation is a certain way doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Like, Compassion, that's the biggest thing that I've heard is compassion. And whether it's right or wrong, I think that there is a perception that women are going to be more compassionate judges. Right? Similar I, thoughts? I think, yeah. I think I would agree with that. I mean, you know, if, if it may be a matter of human nature, you think about like if you're, if you're a kid and you, you know, you've got an issue, who do you go to? Do you go to mom or dad? You know, oh, who's, who, who's going to be more sympathetic? Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. It, it could be as sort of, yeah. you know, instinctual as, as kind of that, um, that feeling that people uh -huh. may have when they're looking at a couple names on the ballot. I don't know. But yeah. I, do, I do agree with the, the com, you know, the compassionate. Um, or, aspect. Are, are the challenges the same uh, for a, a woman judge as they are for a, a, a male judge? Um, in, in, what, in, in any, in any I, I don't know. I mean, oftentimes, you know, look, it's the workplace. I mean, essentially, you're doing a job. Yep. You know, and all we hear about, you know, hey, there's a lot of, you know, workplace inequities, and, and there's different, um, you know, um, um, Situations right. that, that women need to go through that men don't. You know, is that does that exist? Do you feel on the bench as well? I, I mean, I, mean, the I, money, have, the I have not yet. Same, I right? have not yeah. yet been on the bench, so okay. I don't know that I can speak from experience in turn in that sense. I mean, I do. I do see though. You know, there are so many women that have been elected and that are, that are that are doing an excellent mm -hmm. job on the bench. That I, you know, I see them as as role models, and and I think, right. you know, I think. 
I think you can accomplish just as, as much. Um, you know, may, maybe there are some, maybe there will be some some challenges, but you know, I, I'm I'm fully ready to, to embrace each of those when when I get there. So both of you are um, in January, assuming you're you're elected and, and you get sworn in um, in January. You both become judges, and what happens? You have to, we have a judicial college in in Nevada, and a kind of uh, one of the things that our new judicial college in Reno does is that they have a class, kind of a training class for new judges, right? So you, that's required. Yep. 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 You go up to Reno, and how long is that program? Two weeks, I believe. Two weeks. I believe so. So what are you most skeptical, uh, not skeptical, uh, what, are, what, are, what are you most um, tentative about? Um, I mean, is, is it, you know, it always seemed to me, when, you make a ju when you're a judge, you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And making decisions is the hardest part of the job. You know, it's um, any decision you make, 50% of the people are going to disagree with, right. right? You have somebody on each side. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and it's oftentimes not easy to make a decision because you do, and often, particularly when you have compassion. Yeah. Right? Because sometimes you can have a lot of compassion, but uh, the justice requires something else. Right. I mean, I, for, for me, I think it will actually be somewhat easier to step into the role, a neutral role as a judge as opposed to being an advocate. Because oftentimes when I, when I look at a case, I, I, I see all of the arguments on either side that could be made. And you know, I know what argument I have to make as an advocate, and I might, you know, I, I realize it's not the, it's, it's not, it's not going to prevail. But I have to make it. Mm -hmm. As a judge, I'm no longer going to be in in the position to to have to, you know, make make arguments that are the best for my client, but that aren't, um, you know, I, I get to find what the law is. I get to, you know, make make. I think the decision making process is going to be a lot easier when when you can look at, you know, the language of a statute, how the words work together come to a conclusion, and, and it's really, you know, the, I, I believe that there are right answers in the law, and I believe you can find them. Okay, yeah, I mean, look, I'm a good lawyer, and you both of you are excellent lawyers, look at both sides of everything, so that transitions right into where a judge is, because then they also should be listening to both sides, make that decision, and make it clearly and, uh, and quickly, we hope, judges. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, Thank you so much, uh, Deborah Westbrook. Uh, Deborah you. is running, so make sure you get yes. out in November and vote for uh, your candidate for uh, Court of Appeals, Nevada Court, Court of Appeals. And Nadia, we look forward to seeing you on the bench in January. You've already won. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very Nadia much. Nadia Wood, us. Deborah Westbrook. Thank, Thank you, you ladies. Thank you so much. There are so many beautiful places to ride a bike in Vegas. The Strip, the mountains, the desert. An accident can happen at any time. Trust me, I know. I've been in one. Enough said. Call Ed.